last session of the inaugural disrupt track on DSM. Um, for this session, we have uh, originally was planned four pages, but one of them uh, the, the one of the conference. So that will be a link to the available on the web page. So it's the, the, the third talk and now we done. So we have the other three. And uh, for the first uh, talk, the presenter will be uh, oh, me. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Uh, he's a PhD uh, student in PhD um, in Zurich, uh, where he's working in computer architecture and uh, dependability and uh, security concerns related to fire, right? Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so, I'll present our work an experimental analysis of raw hammer in HPM 2D RAM chips. Uh, let me first explain the raw hammer vulnerability really quick. This is a typical DRAM based system where we have a CPU and a DRAM module. We will look at the simplified depiction of this DRAM chip that I highlight here. This simple DRAM chip contains many DRAM nodes. And in order to access data in a row, for example, row two, the memory controller must first open this row. When it's done with the data in this row, the memory controller closes this row to be able to access another row, for example. And doing this repeatedly, opening and closing this row induces bit flips on neighboring rows. And doing it even further, will increase the blast radius of this effect and induce bit flips on many other rows. We call this the row hammer phenomenon, and we refer to the rapidly opened and closed row as the aggressor row, and the rows that contain bit flips as the victim rows. And a simple program like the one I show on the bottom left can induce the, these bit flips in main memory. And prior work such as this one has shown that row hammer is a widespread phenomenon that affects multiple DRAM, many DRAM chips from many different vendors in the field. And this is a problem because the code that I showed you in the previous slide uh, accesses one memory location and it has unintended side effects on data in other memory locations. And essentially, this breaks memory isolation and memory isolation is a key property of secure and reliable systems today. And many prior works, including this one that I show, uh, have shown that raw hammers uh, can be used to take over systems. Many of the newer DRAM chips or modules are also vulnerable to Rohan, as uh, shown by this prior work. And considering these recent developments in uh, Rohammer, we asked the question, what about high bandwidth memory? If, are high bandwidth memory chips vulnerable to Rohammer? And if so, how does it, the vulnerability look like in these chips? These chips are harbor new architectural characteristics that might affect the Rohammer vulnerability in different ways. And understanding raw hammer will enable us to develop more efficient and more effective solutions for it. However, no rigorous study uh, demonstrates the raw hammer vulnerability in high bandwidth memory. And our goal is to experimentally characterize, uh, experimentally analyze how vulnerable these chips are to raw hammer. Therefore, we perform a detailed experimental characterization of raw hammer in a real modern HPM to DRAM chip. And we provide two main findings in our work. First, we show that there is substantial variation in raw hammer uh, vulnerability in different physical locations of this HPM2 DRAM chip. Um, different channels and 3D stacked HPM2 chips exhibit different levels of raw hammer vulnerability, and DRAM rows near the end of a DRAM bank are more raw hammer resilient compared to other rows. Second, we investigate the existence of on die mitigation mechanisms that prevent raw hammer, and we find that this chip implements an undisclosed on DRAM die raw hammer mitigation mechanism. And this uh, mechanism in particular resembles the one prior work has found in real DDR fortunes. Here's the outline of my talk. I'll continue by introducing HPM DRAM organization. So this is a typical HPM2 DRAM system. It consists of a compute chip and multiple high bandwidth memory DRAM chips. All of these are integrated into the same package to form the HPM system. And this is a different view of the same system. We have uh, the FPGA and the HPM DRAM chip. Um, put on the same package and co are connected by a, a silicon interposer. The memory controller in the FPGA communicates with the buffer die on the HPM chip uh, over an HPM interface. The HPM chip contains multiple 3D stacked DRAM dies, and in each DRAM die, we have multiple uh, channels, one or more channels. And these channels connect to the buffer die through high silicon through silicon minus. Now, let's look at what's inside the channel. And HPM DRAM channel contains multiple pseudo channels, and each pseudo channel we have multiple bands. A band contains subarrays, and a subarray contains many DRAM rows. Finally, we have uh, many DRAM cells, storage cells, and a DRAM node. 
Now let's look at what's inside this cell uh, in more detail and its leakage characteristics and the Rohmer phenomena in a bit more detail. Each DRAM cell encodes data in fundamentally leaky capacitors. Uh, here's a simplified diagram of a cell where the capacitor in red stores data in the access transistor determines that the cell is being accessed. And there are many leakage paths by which charge can enter or exit the cell. And the key thing to note is that the stored data can become corrupted if too much charge leaks. That is to say, if the capacitor voltage degrades too much. And here we're looking at that. So this is showing the capacitor voltage on the y-axis over time on the x-axis. And we see that the voltage degrades in an exponential decay over time. There is a threshold agreement under which we can no longer guarantee that this data is Cell will store the correct data. And as long as we're above this line, we consider this a retention success. Uh, however, when we go be below this line, this is a retention failure. And to prevent retention failures, we periodically restore the charge uh, in the cell by using periodic refresh operations. And we refer to the distance or delay between consecutive periodic refresh operations as the refresh window. Now let's take a look at the same diagram in the context of a row hammer attack. If an aggressor, if an attacker activates a nearby row enough times, uh, the charge leakage rate can be accelerated to a point of failure. After this point, no matter how many refresh operations we schedule, the refresh operation will see the value as a zero and, and uh, restore the incorrect value of the cell. Let me reiterate the problem. Uh, no prior work rigorously studies the raw camera vulnerability in high bandwidth memory chips. And our goal is to experimentally analyze how vulnerable these chips are to raw camera. So let me introduce the testing methodology we use. Uh, our infrastructure is based on the DRAM and the DDR4 testing infrastructure. And we adopt this to work with HVM2 chips. This is a picture of our testing setup. We use the Bitware XUP VDH HVM2 FPGA board. We control the heating pad and the cooling fan with the Arduino temperature controller to keep the uh, temperature of our testing setup stable. This setup gives us fine grained control over DRAM commands, and we can uh, have as low as a 1.66 nanosecond delay between consecutive DRAM commands that we issue to the HPM chip. We carefully reuse the rigorous characterization, raw hammer characterization methodology that was described in, the pri in prior work. And we uh, use the worst case double sided row hammer access pattern that I depict here. We record the bit flips in the sandwich victim row. Our HBM2 chip contains uh, eight channels, two pseudo channels in each channel, 16 max in each pseudo channel, and 16,000 one kilobyte size rows in each bank. And we test all channels, pseudo channels, and banks. And we test the first, middle, and last 3,000 rows in a bank. Finally, we keep the HPM2 chip's temperature at 85 Celsius. We measure two metrics in our study. First, the bit error rate is the fraction of cells that experience a row hammer bit flip. And for this, uh, to obtain this metric, we use a hammer count of 512,000. We activate the rows 512,000 times. This metric, uh, the, this metric, when this metric becomes higher, the row hammer vulnerability essentially becomes worse because we have more bit flips in a row. And the second one is the hammer count for the first bit fillet, which is the number of activations required to close the first bit fillet in the victim row. And as this metric becomes smaller, it means that we need a shorter time to induce the first bit fillet. We use the data patterns depicted in this table uh, to initialize DRAM rows prior to performing row hammer. And I'll describe uh, how data gets laid out onto DRAM, multiple DRAM rows, over an example of rows type zero. So we initialize the victim row with all zeros, the aggressor's neighboring this victim row with all ones, and seven other uh, rows that neighbor the aggressor rows with all zeros. And this is another example that shows what changes in the layout when we use the checkered zero data pattern. And we use all four of these data patterns. And we also determine the worst case data pattern of a row uh, as the data pattern that causes the smallest number of activations to induce the first bit for them for that. And this is always one of the four data parts we test. And we provide two main analyses in our study. First, we investigate how row, row hammer vulnerability changes um, different, uh, across different HPM components in the HPM chip we test in terms of bit error rate and the number of activations required to use the first bit flip. 
And we investigate if the HPM chip implements an undisclosed role hammer mitigation that might resemble the ones we know that exist in DDR4 chips. I'll share the results of our Rohammer spatial variation analysis, starting with the three key takeaways we made from our study. First, uh, different 3D stack HPM2 channels exhibit different Rohammer vulnerability. Second, DRAM rows near the end of a DRAM bag uh, exhibit significantly smaller bit error rate than other DRAM rows. And third, the activation count needed to induce the first bit flip substantially changes with the data patterns we use and the physical location of the DRAM node. This figure shows the Rohan bit error rate distribution across rows in a channel uh, on the y-axis and different data patterns on the x-axis, although this is a simple version, so it only has one data pattern. Different bars here show the distribution for different channels. We make two observations. First uh, is a simple one. We observe bit flips in every tested row across all HBM2 channels. Second, we see that the bit error rate varies across channels. Uh, we find groups of two channels that have uh, similar bit error rates. And basically, group, these groups of two channels have different bit error rates compared to other groups of two channels. So that is the ones that I highlight here. And this is a bigger version of the plot. We observe that the data pattern has an effect on the bit error rate distribution. And we see that our observations are uh, valid for other data patterns. And finally, I highlight the distributions we get for the worst case data pattern here. We observe up to uh, 200, around 262 bit flips uh, in a row of 8,000 DRM cells when we use 512,000 activations. This plot shows the bit error rate again on the y axis, uh, but row addresses this time on the x axis. And different lines here show the bit error rate for different channels. And we only show the last 3,000 rows here. Uh, and because of that, and because of because dashed vertical lines uh, represent the reverse engineered subarray boundaries, uh, the first subarray is not completely shown in this figure. So we observe that the bit error rate is substantially smaller in the last subarray, that's to say the last 832 rows. And we also see that the bit error rate goes up and down in a wavy pattern as we increase the row at this. And this bit error rate is highest in the middle of a subway and is lowest at either end of a subway. This is the bigger version of the plot where we show the first and middle 3,000 rows we test. And we see that our second observation holds for uh, holds across all tested DRM nodes. This plot shows the number of activations needed to induce the first bit for the, the distribution of that in a channel on the y axis. Again, we have different uh, boxes to show the distribution for different channels. And on the x-axis, we show the data parameters. We observe that HC first is as low as 14, around 14,000. And this means that we can induce the first bit so in around one millisecond. We see that the HC first distribution depends heavily on the data pattern that we use. And this essentially means that to assess the raw camera vulnerability of our DRAM chips, HPM2 DRAM chips, we must exhaustively test all data patterns. We also investigate the variation bit error rate across rows in a bank, but uh, due to time limits, I will skip this, but I'll be happy to take your questions. We form two key hypotheses from our characterization study. First, we attribute the similarity in bit error rate um, within groups of two channels. To, these, uh, to basically the physical placement of these channels in the HPM2 DRAM chip. We think that groups of two channels share the same DRAM die, and we think that our HPM chip has two channels in a die. Second, the row hammer bit error rate changes with the row's proximity to the sense amplifiers as it's highest in the middle of a subarray. And we think that the significant drop in the last subarray might be attributed to the subarray proximity to the bank IO circuitry. We make this key observation from our study that the bit error rate and the activation count in this first bit flip changes across channels. And this has two key implications on attacks and defenses. First, uh, attackers can leverage this to and, and use the most program and vulnerable channel to accelerate uh, the preparation and the attack phases of their uh, codes. This means that attackers can potentially take over systems more quickly. 
And second, um, mitigations can allocate fewer resources to protect uh, Rohemer resilient channels and more resources to protect Rohemer vulnerable channels. And this could allow for more efficient mitigation mechanisms to be developed. I'll now describe our second analysis on on DRM die Rohemer mitigation mechanisms. Uh, here are two key takeaways from our study, uh, this study. First, uh, the CHIPI test implements an undisclosed on DRM die Rohemer mitigation technique. And we find that this resembles prior work has already found in real DDR versions. The HPM2 standard defines a target row refresh mode where the memory controller in the CPU or the FPGA and the HPM DRAM chip collaborate to prevent programmer bit flips. But we also know that real DDR4 chips implement undisclosed uh, memory controller transparent on DRAM by mitigation mechanism. These mechanisms typically take actions hidden behind the latency of a periodic refresh operation. And we want to understand if a similar mechanism exists in HPM2 DRAM chips. And we use the methodology presented in this paper where the key idea is to use data retention failures as a side channel to detect when a row is refreshed by a on DRAM die mitigation mechanism. And we reuse the source code that was made available by the authors of this link. I'll describe our experiment. So we first find a DRAM row, R, that uh, has a retention time of T. This means that this row will exhibit retention errors if we don't refresh it for T units of time. And on the bottom, we show a timeline of actions taken by us as the tester and a hypothetical mitigation technique. Uh, and because initially at time equals zero, we refresh R. We wait for half T. And then we have an R plus one, which is adjacent to this victim role R once. And then let's look at what this hypothetical mitigation mechanism will do. So it will sample this as an aggressive row activation. And then we issue a periodic refresh operation as the tester to trigger this mechanism to take an action. And we expect it to refresh the victim row, maybe do that. And then we wait for another half T, we read out the row R and check for bit flips in row R. There won't be any bit flips, if it, only if the mitigation mechanism exists and it has refreshed row R at half T. However, it will, row R will experience retention errors if there is no mitigation mechanism and because no one will refresh it at half T. We perform this experiment and we find that the HPM2 chip implements an online mitigation mechanism. And we also find that this mechanism performs a victim row refresh operation after every 17 periodic refresh operations. And we find that this resembles one prior work has found in a real DDR4 chip from one manufacturer. And we intend to uncover more details about the inner workings of this mitigation mechanism as part of our future work. So I'll conclude my talk with a brief summary now. We provide the first detailed experimental characterization of row hammer in a modern HPM to DRAM chip. And uh, we find that different channels exhibit different vulnerability row hammer vulnerability, and DRAM rows near the end of a DRAM bank are more row hammer resilient. Uh, these findings can be leveraged to develop either uh, both, or both powerful attacks and more efficient mitigations. And we identify this on DRAM die row hammer mitigation mechanism exists in at least one modern HPM to the chip. And to present more insights into the row hammer vulnerability in HPM, we plan to test more DRAM chips at using more data patterns at different temperature and voltage levels. We want to investigate read disturb based interference. Interference affects like Rohan across different 3D stack HPM DRAM channels. And finally, we'd like to study the effects of the new read disturb phenomenon, row press, that was introduced in ESCA very recently. And this, our, uh, a version of our paper is available on archive with this link. And thank you for your attention. I will be happy to take your questions. The reason why I am asking is that HTM is different from the DDR, especially they are very dependent on the temperature. Yeah, uh, we use, well, we don't periodically refresh the chip when we're doing the raw hammer characterization, but we assume a retention period of 32 milliseconds in our experiment, 32 milliseconds. 
in our experiments. Yes, yeah, in your experiment, yeah. the temperature was 85 degrees Celsius. That's correct. We set the temperature to 85 degrees Celsius. So 85 Celsius, I, I don't remember exactly, but uh, 85 Celsius. 60, 60, 60, 60. Uh, I will double check it in the standard and maybe I can respond to you offline in an email. Okay. But what that determines essentially only is, uh, let me go back to this slide very quickly. Maybe not so quickly. I'm just worried. Yeah. Uh, your certain pattern yeah. should be confused. Yeah. That's, that's that's correct. That's absolutely correct. So basically, if we are violating the retention period in our experiments, we don't know if all the errors we are observing are all hammer errors or some of them are retention errors. We didn't do that analysis in our experiment, but the retention period would only affect the number of activations we issue in our experiments. 512K uh, give, basically gives us a retention time of around 30 milliseconds. But since we have seen errors with much fewer activation counts, as we as I show here, sorry, even if yeah, even if uh, we only have sixteen milliseconds, we will see row hammer bits. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's the target temperature of our temperature controller setup. It measures the on chip temperature through. Uh, the, the temperature we measure uh, is coming from the HPM chips on die sensors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but con the controller could have some error, right. which would be minimum. Uh, it's supposed to be within test logic allocated for testing purposes, like after manufacturing. Uh, I don't know that. Where exactly it is. Yeah. I just have a small yeah. question on that side. Uh, so this faster memory, uh, uh, identity memory, mm -hmm. uh, your intuition at this point where you were doing this analysis, they are more readable or less readable? Because typically this kind of problems on low number in particular, but when you have something that is faster, yeah, that's a very good question. That was our intuition also. We expected to see worse program vulnerability characteristics. So this is a slide I prepared for that. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> so basically, this is showing NHC first scale, the NHC first, like the number of activations we need to do to induce bit collapse. Is it infinite? We're all good. Programmer doesn't need it. If it's one, we're doomed. We have to refresh with every activation. And this, these are like prior works. That investigated row hammer phenomenon in different technologies. And this, sorry, uh, the result of an analysis places us here the worst case number of, like, the worst number of the smallest activation count we observe is 14,000. People have also, in the past, other words have observed as low as 5,000 uh, HC first in LPDDI for chips. This is where we are. But uh, Again, this is like a preliminary study and we tested only one HPM chip and we did not test all the rows. We might end up with a lower number than what prior has found if it has more chips. Yeah. Thanks a lot.